think we want to thank our friend Scott today. He just does such a beautiful job on the piano, doesn't he? Thank you, Scott. Well, second Sunday of the new year, ready or not, here we are, right? And we want to start off with this scripture passage this morning from Psalm 125. You know, when life gets crazy and things seem out of control and up is down and down feels up, it's a verse like this that we need to remember, a passage like this from the book of Psalms. Those who trust in the Lord, what does it tell us? Are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, and you know Jerusalem is up, it's elevated, and there's, it's on a mountain, and there's mountains around it. So the Lord, this is his promise, surrounds his people from this time and forever. Isn't that a great verse? To know that the Lord can be trusted just as we look at a mountain and it stays where it is. So is our trust in the Lord. It's well founded in him. Well, we're going to lift our voices in worship and praise right now. So those of you that would like and are able, why don't we stand together? And we're so glad to have our friend Ray back with us. Ray, the Lord bless you today. Hast thou 
adore Him. All that has life and breath, come now and praise us before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for all we adore Him. Majesty. Majesty, worship His majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from His throne unto His and raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus, magnify. Come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Amen. David, come up to appoint us. I'm sure we are all very much aware with the subject of dehydration. Um, I know for one, I need to drink more water. <laughs> but um, and we know what the consequences of you know, physical dehydration can be. But there is also another dehydration that is very, very, um, should be very concerning to us, and that is spiritual dehydration. But thank God that with Jesus we have spiritual living water. Yes. He supplies streams of living water. There is a fountain waiting for you pure living water flowing within if you are thirsty come and receive this living water Jesus will give to you never to thirst again. Come and be filled. 
If you believe Jesus is Lord Streams of living water will be yours Come to the Lord and drink from his cup streams of living water wait for you he is the savior he is the lord poured out like water Nailed to the cross, he was my sacrifice, sacrifice. and he took my place. He took my place. He was on Calvary, Ooh. but then he rose again, pure living water. Flowing within If you believe Jesus is Lord Streams of living water Will be yours Come to the Lord Drink from his cup Streams of living water Wait for you Those streams of living water Wait for you Streams of living water Wait for you Well, I hope everybody is feeling warm in here. We try to keep the heat on. I know it was a little cool for some of you walking over today, but hopefully when we come in here, we're feeling it's warm and uh, comfortable. And we just thank Ray, can we just thank Ray and Sherry again? So wonderful to hear they're sharing their music with us today. It's been a, a few weeks since it, they've been able to do that together, and we just appreciate their ministry here on Sunday mornings. Well, Today we're going to begin a new series. You might have noticed that on your outline this morning. It's called Going Public with Your Faith. And it's all about learning and discovering how do we take what God has done in saving us and then sharing that with the people that God brings into our lives. And so today is a, is a bit of an introduction as we begin to kind of think in that direction. If you have your Bible with you today, I'd like to invite you to turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, which will kind of give us a little idea of where we're headed in this series together. Now, while you're turning there, I have to tell you about a little ritual that we have, we see played out in our home from time to time. It's called Honey... Have you seen my keys? Some of you might relate to what I'm going to tell you. I don't know how many times I've started out getting ready, ready to go out the door to church, only to find that my keys have been placed somewhere where I can't possibly find them. And so I retrace my steps, and I look around, and I try to find my keys and I can't seem to locate them. And then after a few minutes, I'll hear this wonderful, lovely voice of my wife in saying, Honey, here they are. 
I found them. And I'll often ask her, well, where were they? And she, she would often tell me, right on the chest where you left them last night. Well, today we're going to look at a passage that contains a couple of stories where people lost something that to them in that day and in that time was certainly a lot more valuable to them than just merely lost keys. In Luke 15, Jesus tells two of three stories we're going to look at today about what I call God's lost and found department. The reason for these stories that we're going to look at in just a few minutes begins with a problem that Luke notes for us that Jesus was having with the religious leaders. In Luke chapter 15, if you notice with me, verses 1 and 2. Now all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now can't you just begin to imagine those religious leaders and how they were talking among themselves? Well, have you seen what that young rabbi has been doing lately? No. What's he doing now? Why, he's hanging out with all these low-life people and those of questionable moral character. No real rabbi would ever stoop to doing something as low as that. In fact, he's even eating meals with them, and they're listening to his stories. Doesn't he realize that by associating with people of undesirable character like that, that he's actually defiling himself and will be unable to go and worship in the temple on Saturday? Can't you just imagine the, the heads were and the, and the tongues were wagging as they were talking about all of these ridiculous things that they were seeing Jesus do? In fact, the very idea of Jesus having anything to do with social rejects and outcasts must have been just seemed like an outrage to them in their minds of those religious leaders. But notice more, more closely in verse 2 what Jesus is being criticized for. Notice it says, he receives sinners. And that, that word receives literally means to openly welcome, to warmly invite in other words, he was being criticized for engaging in conversation, outcasts and misfits who the religious community would have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with. The word sinners there also is the word for irreligious. It has to do with people who, who would have nothing to do with religious worship or spiritual things. You see, Jesus was being criticized for something else, though. Did you notice in verse 2, what else were the religious leaders criticizing him for? Notice, he was being criticized for eating meals with them. In other words, Jesus actually had the audacity to eat meals with spiritually undesirable people. And the religious leaders had never seen anything quite like that. That was the sort of thing for front page tabloid news in those days. Jesus was being singled out and labeled for the kind of people he was choosing to hang out with and spend time with. But please, this morning, I don't want you to miss the real lesson here, the most important lesson here. Do you realize what this passage is actually telling us about Jesus? and the kind of person that he actually was. Notice on your outline this morning, do you realize this? In Jesus, here's what we're seeing. In Jesus, we see depravity attracted to deity. Now think about that for a moment. In Jesus, can we put that up on the screen back there, Ian? There we go. In Jesus, think about this. We see depravity attracted to deity. In other words, 
people who, who wouldn't think of ever going to church were attracted to Jesus. Jesus was attractive to lost people. I want to ask you this morning, as, as you interact with people at town and country manor or in your world, are you making Jesus attractive to other people by the way you behave, by the way you talk, by the way you deal with people? You see, wayward people were being drawn to Jesus like a magnet. And unfortunately, sometimes instead of our, our conversation and our way of life drawing people to Jesus, so oftentimes our very manner, sometimes our condemnation, sometimes our judgmental attitude pushes people away. I want to share this story with you that I came across some time back. A man was working with down and out people in the city of Chicago. And a prostitute came up to him in wretched straits. She was homeless. She was sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told this gentleman she had been renting out her daughter, two years old, to men interested in kinky sex. She said she made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could ever earn on her own in a single night. She had to do it, she said, to support her own drug habit. I could barely handle listening to that sordid story. I had no idea what I should say to this woman. At last, I asked her if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. Wow. You know, as I thought about that story, I realized, you know, that's the way a lot of irreligious people view Christians and the church today, isn't it? Unfortunately. You know, we have a huge image problem to overcome as Christians. The church with people in the world, don't we? And as we think about what we're looking at here in Luke chapter 15, we begin to realize that, that Jesus, the epitome of absolute holiness and righteousness, was actually attractive to unrighteous and unholy people, and that is absolutely a miracle. Rather than pushing them away, Jesus was attracting these people to himself, and that is remarkable. You know, there was something about Jesus that was so inviting that even unbelieving and carnal, depraved people sought him out, were drawn to him, loved to be with him, enjoyed his company. Do you know that in the Gospel of Luke, I found this interesting. In the Gospel of Luke, do you know that there are four times, and this is one of them, there are four places where Luke specifically notes the fact that Jesus was willing to spend time with these kinds of people. In fact, I'm going to invite you just to turn over, if you would, to Luke chapter 7 for just a moment. And verses 33 and 34, we may even have that on the screen. I guess we do this morning. And Jesus draws an interesting comparison between himself, and Luke wants to record this because he wants us to understand how accessible and welcoming Jesus was to other kinds of people than those who just populated the synagogues. For John the Baptist, Luke says, 
had come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. What's wrong with that guy? The Son of Man, by contrast, has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, and watch this, a friend of who? Tax gatherers, and there's, a, there's that word again, sinners, those irreligious people. Notice, a friend, not just an associate, a friend. People were calling Jesus their friend. Jesus was calling these people his friends. Isn't that amazing? In Luke chapter 5, this one I don't have on the screen, but if you take a look at Luke chapter 5, I want to show you a third reference here that Luke makes of the kind of people that Jesus was with, and this too is rather noteworthy. Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. It says, and after he went out, he noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And the Bible says he left everything in verse 29, and Luke, uh, Levi rather, gave a big reception for him in his house. And what did Levi do? He invited his friends. Well, who were his friends? It says, a great cloud, crowd of tax gatherers and other people, you know, likewise kind of people, we're reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling among themselves, saying "What to his disciples, why do you guys eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus intervenes and get this, look at what he said. And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. You ever read that and thought, what, is that? what exactly does that mean? When Jesus said, it is not those who are well. In other words, Jesus said, it is not those who think that they are okay on their own. That's who he's referring to. People who think that they're already right with God, that they don't need to change, they don't need to repent. That's who he's talking about. But he says, but rather he has come from those who are sick and know that they're sick and know that they have a need. But those who, re who reject and think, well, I'm fine just the way I am. I don't need to change. Now, why do I need Jesus? Those are the ones who, Jesus said, they're not open. They're not receptive. They're not responsive. Those who think they don't need it. But those who recognize their true need, they embrace it and say yes to Jesus. I was watching, Joy and I were watching something on YouTube the other night. Uh, some of you will remember the actor Dennis Quaid. I didn't realize that, that he had come from a, a born-again family, had wandered away for a number of years, and he has really come back to Jesus. They had him over at Harvest here, and uh, he was sharing a couple of songs, and he's just come out with an album, and I, I love the title of the album. Here's what it's called. The title of the album is called Fallen, Gospel Songs for Sinners. I love that gospel songs for sinners you know because sometimes we can spend so much time and so many years in the church that we just kind of sometimes fail to realize and recognize how needy we still all are and still need more of Jesus in our lives and I think Dennis Quaid is recognizing that but here's the question I'd like us as we come back to Luke 15 I'd like us to entertain for a few moments this morning and it's this what was it that made Jesus so appealing and accessible to people like this, people of the street, people of the world. What was, what was it that made Jesus so attractive to people like this? I like to say it this way, Ray, what was his secret sauce? What was it, what was it that, that something about Jesus that made him different from all the other religious leaders? And instead of, instead of rejecting, people feeling rejected when they were around those other religious leaders, they felt drawn to Jesus and they wanted to be around him. And I, I think we maybe find the answer to that, at least a clue, in John 1.14. And we'll put that passage up on the screen for you. John 1.14. Remember, you remember this. And the Word became flesh. Just what we've been celebrating during the Christmas season, and dwelt among us. 
And we saw his glory, his magnificence, his abilities. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. And then watch this. He was full of grace and truth. What was it that made Jesus attractive to irreligious people? If you'll look on your outline this morning, I believe we, we find the clue right here. Sinners, irreligious people were attracted to Jesus. Why? Because he made them feel accepted, comfortable, and loved without affirming their sin. See, the world today wants to, wants to take people and say, well, you know, we'll just love you any way you are, and, and the sin and whatever baggage you bring with you is okay. Well, that may be love, but that's not loving people in truth. We want to accept and love people where they are. But the good news is they don't have to stay. They don't have to remain the way they are. The truth is Jesus can heal and change people from the inside out. And Jesus had the uh, amazing ability to love and accept people, yet without ignoring their sin. That's truth. In other words, he loved them. That's grace. But he also leveled with them. That's truth. And I love the story in John chapter 8. You remember the woman who was caught in adultery. Jesus loved and ministered to her. And she had an amazing experience when she came and knelt down before Jesus. The religious leaders wanted to condemn her, remember? But Jesus loved her where she was. I believe her heart was transformed, but he didn't just send her away as if everything was all well. He said, go and what? Sin no more. There is both love and grace and truth together at the same time. And that's what I believe made Jesus so unique and so different from all the other religious leaders. Now, I want to I show you a passage that you probably read this before and, and thought to yourself, I wonder exactly what does this mean? It's found in Matthew chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. And this is the Old Testament now quoting, describing the kind of ministry that Jesus would have when he came to earth. And like I say, you probably read this, but maybe not. What you say, what exactly does that mean? Notice what it says, describing Jesus, his ministry. A battered reed he will not break off. And a smoldering wick he will not put out. Until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, watch this, he came to the Jews first, but he didn't leave out us Gentiles. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. You know, I've often read that. I thought, well, what does that mean? A battered reed he will not break off. What's he referring to? What's a battered reed? A battered reed was something that was no good. It was broken. It, it couldn't be used to, to stabilize anything. It wasn't, didn't serve any good purpose. And it's an analogy for broken people. Broken people, he's not going to break out. In other words, he's not going to take those who recognize in, they're in need and they're broken, and he's not going to batter them with judgment and condemnation. That's what it means. He wasn't going to make it worse for them than it already was, but he was going to lift them up. Notice it says, and a smoldering wick. What's a smoldering wick? A smoldering wick is a wick that has pretty much burned itself out. It's not good for giving light anymore. And that idea of a smoldering wick helps us to think about people today who maybe feel useless, unnecessary, unrecognized. They don't feel important. They feel forgotten. Society treats them as outcasts and people who don't really matter. And it's, it's the kind of people that so oftentimes in the report David was sharing today, as we are out on the streets in Santa Ana and Orange, we're coming encountering people that in many ways have been marginalized by our society. They, they really can't contribute much. They don't matter much. And yet what we know is God loves them just as much as he loves and cares for us. But I just love that passage because it tells us that to the, those who were beaten down and felt useless and felt their lives didn't matter and didn't count, Jesus was not going to make their life worse or more miserable. He was going to lift them up. Isn't that beautiful? 
That's the kind of person Jesus was. That's the way he ministered and treated people. Now, because the religious leaders could not comprehend grace or understand a God who loved wayward people, Jesus then goes on in this passage in Luke 15, if you're there, to give us these first uh, two parables that we're going to look at this morning, illustrating the true nature and the heart of who God is. So first of all, we have the parable of the lost sheep. Luke 15, would you follow along with me in verses 3 through 7. So he told them, that is them, the religious leaders, a parable saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And then Jesus gives us his summary, his commentary. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Beautiful story. Because shepherds, as you remember, were personally responsible for their flock. If a sheep was missing, the shepherd had to go out into the field and he had to find that sheep. If it was dead, the shepherd was required to bring home the fleece to show how it had died, what had happened to it. And for that reason, shepherds had to be very, very good trackers. They had to be able to follow the footprints of lost sheep, sometimes for miles and miles, in order for, for them to bring back that lost sheep. Now, let me ask you, what do we know about sheep? Do we know much about sheep? Well, several things come to mind, don't they, when we think about sheep. First, sheep go astray. They have a tendency to wander off on their own, and they don't have a very good sense of direction of where they're wandering or where they're going. Second, sheep are very stubborn. They have a mind of their own, and they're not inclined to be very cooperative. That's why the shepherd, when he goes out and finds a lost sheep, to bring it back, he has to put it on, its shoulder, on his shoulders because the sheep has a mind of its own. It's going to keep going on its own. He's got to forcibly grab that sheep, pick it up, put it on his shoulders because the only way he and the sheep are going to get back together. And then thirdly, what do we know about sheep? They are very, very stupid. Have you ever noticed you will never see sheep performing tricks? Now, we can train horses and dogs, and seals, even lions. But you'll never see sheep. You can't teach them tricks. They're too dumb to be able to learn and remember anything. Now we know there's a good reason why God likens us to sheep, don't we? So the shepherd in our story goes out, he finds the lost sheep, and he brings it back rejoicing over its recovery. And Jesus, notice, interprets the parable for us, doesn't he? Equating lost sheep with lost people and adding that all heaven rejoices when just one lost person comes to faith. What do we learn from that? Well, notice your outline. God is in the business of seeking lost people. God is in the business of pursuing lost people. Now, we may give up on people, but God certainly does not. In fact, God doesn't just sit back and merely wait for people to find Him. God is act actively involved in our world in the relentless pursuit of lost people. He takes the initiative. It's He is the one who goes after us and engages us. 
And sometimes he does that in some of the most unusual and creative ways I, could, I have ever heard. I've got to share with you a couple of stories that are just absolutely incredible. You talk about God going out of his way to reach people who are lost. I was reading one time about an Australian shepherd. He was out in the plains of Australia, miles away from any city, any civilization. And as he's walking along the plains with his sheep, guess what he discovers? A piece of newspaper is blowing across the prairie where he's walking and tending his sheep. It blows right near where he's standing and he walks over and he picks up that sheet of paper, Sandy, and he begins to read it, not having any idea what he's reading, but he begins to read and he's drawn in and he becomes interested and little does he know until he gets to the very end of that sheet of newspaper that he was reading literally the words that had been printed of a sermon and it was printed in the local newspaper and just happened to be blowing randomly across the prairie where this shepherd was. He picks it up, he reads the sermon, and he comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? You see, God is seeking lost people all the time. I want to tell you another story. This this will really this will really blow your mind. Did you know one time there was a, actually a scuba diver and he was down collecting shells and, and uh, various aquatic life on the ocean floor when he came as he was walking along and swimming. This is just absolutely amazing. He's going along and he sees an oyster on the, o- on the ocean floor. And the oyster has something caught and it's kind of waving in the, uh, in the water, something white, and it's caught in the shell of that oyster. Well, he goes down there, very curious, what is this? And he gets down there and he's able to tear this little sheet of paper out of the shell of the oyster. Well, of course, it's all wet and soggy. He gets back up, gets to the surface, dries it out. You'll never guess what it was. He starts to read it. It's a gospel tract. He reads the gospel tract and comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Finding it on the ocean floor. God is in relentless pursuit of lost people. That's the heart of God. That's what Jesus is trying to communicate in this first story right here. We can't wait for lost people to find us, to come to us. We have to go to them. And you know, one of the places where I love to do that, it's so much fun, is my fishing pool. I haven't got to tell you a lot about this, but as we go through this series, I'll, I'll share with you a little bit more of sort of what I have seen seeing the Lord doing. But, but I go to the gym three days a week and work out. That's kind of my fishing pool because a lot of the time I'm, I'm with, you know, Christians and people in the church, but that's my place to sort of have a chance to minister. And so as I've been going there over a period of months, there's a young Hispanic gal, and she, she gets up real early in the morning, and she's there when it opens. And by the time I get in there, you know, she checks me in when I come to the gym. And I, I just ask her, are you going to college? And just, you know, brief, brief, you know, 20-second conversation, and I'm, I'm off, and she's doing her thing. And so I knew that she had graduated from a tech school, and she was looking for a, a job in, as a medical assistant. And she was trying to get an interview. And I'd been talking just little snippets here, you know, as I go in and out all the time. And so I said, well, I I said, have you gotten an interview? She said, no, I still haven't gotten one. This was a couple of weeks ago. And I said to her, this was my little test, throw it out there. I said, well, you know what? I'll be praying for you that you can get an interview. Well, do you know I just went back this week and I said, how have you gotten an interview? How's that going? She says, yes, I have an interview. And I said, isn't it wonderful that prayer works? And she was so happy. And so I thought, that's good, that's positive. So then a couple days later, I went back in again, and I said, I've got a little something I think you would enjoy reading. And I handed her a a little uh, booklet, Steps to Peace with God. I'm looking forward as a few more opportunities go by. Did you get a chance to read that? What did you think about that? 
And it's just, it's just so fun to realize God places people along our path, and we so often forget that we, like God, have to be in the business of seeking lost people because they are hungry and they are, they are needing a relationship with the Savior. Well, that brings us to a second little parable that Jesus tells here in verse 8. Notice it with me. This is the parable of the lost coin. It's a very short one. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents." Now, here's what you need to know about this simple little story. The lost coin was equal to a day's wage, a denarius. When women got married, part of their endowment was given to them in coins. Oftentimes, women in the, in, in, in the Middle East will wear a frontlet of coins, ten coins around their forehead that they received on their wedding day, similar to what ladies you would think of as a wedding ring. And apparently in the story, something very common all these women wore them, one of the coins got lost. But what we don't realize is when it got lost in a house, they didn't often have a lot of windows. So the houses were very dark, and sometimes for flooring, they would use thatch that would be weaved together. So can you imagine a thatch sort of floor? It's pretty dark, and you've lost one of those shiny silver denarius coins, and you're trying to find it in the floor. That's like looking for a needle in a haystack. That's why when suddenly she comes upon this coin, she is overjoyed, not only because of its value monetarily, but because of the, cement, the sentimental value it holds as well. And she is absolutely overjoyed. Reminds me of a lady we had in one of our churches. Ladies, have you ever lost the diamond in your wedding ring? Sometimes those can come loose, can't they? Sometimes the prongs get a little loose. Every once in a while, Joy goes in and she wants to make sure that, you know, they're tightened by the jeweler so that it, they, it doesn't pop out. But there was a lady in our church and she had lost one of the diamonds in her wedding ring. Now, you talk about something small and difficult to find. She went through her entire house. She looked in every room. She looked at the carpet. She looked at the driveway, the walkway. Do you know where she finally found that little diamond, ladies? In the carpet in her car. As she was driving one day, apparently, maybe she bumped something and the setting was loose and it fell out and it was sitting there in the carpet of her car. Well, can you imagine, how would you feel if you'd lost a diamond and you found it? That's the same way this lady was feeling when she lost this coin. But notice the lesson of the story as Jesus summarizes it once again for us in verse 9 and 10. Here it is on your outline. Whenever someone meets Jesus, what is our Lord telling us? Whenever someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ... It is an occasion for celebration. It is an occasion for rejoicing. And that's what we do around this place. Every time someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ during the previous week, we do what we've done this morning, and David mentioned that. There's our candle lit for us because there was a man that we've never met before, but his name is Manuel. And he placed his faith in Jesus, prayed with Pastor Carlos as they were at a laundromat yesterday. There's another one of those lost people who comes to faith in Jesus. Now, as I wrap this up this morning, let me very quickly give you three final principles I believe these stories illustrate for us today. Because we're on the mission of finding and seeking lost people as our Lord was. Number one, what do we know? Number one, our church exists. Why are we here? Our church exists for those who are not yet in the family of God, who are not yet in God's family, either locally or globally. That's why we're here. 
That's why there's a church located on the campus of town and country. You say, what exactly does that mean? What are the implications of that statement? Well, what I believe it means is, first of all, is that the church isn't here just for us. The church exists primarily for those who aren't even here yet. Do you realize that, that, that reaching out to irreligious people, we, there's a word for that, we often call it what? Evangelism. Do you realize that evangelism is the one thing that you can only do on earth that you'll never be able to do in heaven? Is reach lost people for Jesus. I believe the church exists today because there are lost people in need of Jesus Christ, both in our community and around the world. We exist because people need to find the Savior. And so that's why we do outreach in our community. That's why we support missions with the Christian Missionary Alliance. And we encourage you to give to the Great Commission Fund. That's why we, we have uh, over 700 international workers in over 70 countries of the world. And most of them are in the 1040 window today. And with the Christian Missionary Alliance, someone comes to faith in Jesus once every four minutes just through the work of the Christian Missionary Alliance. That doesn't include what's being done with many other wonderful and fine groups who are doing the exact same thing. But that's the first, I believe, implication from these two parables we looked at this morning. But let me give you a second one, number two. The church is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. The church is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. In other words, we're not just here to meet the whims and wishes of those who attend. The church is not a luxury liner. It's a battleship. Why do I say that? Because we are engaged in a spiritual battle, aren't we? For the hearts and souls of lost people. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, Paul talks about our warfare is in the spiritual realm. We are in a battle every moment of the day. And number three, here's the last one. Number three, we want to be a church. We want to be a people that is attractive and relevant to irreligious people. That is attractive and relevant to irreligious people. Remember how those wayward people were attracted to Jesus? In a same way, in a similar way, we want the church to be meaningful and accessible to irreligious people. You say, what does that involve? One primary, very important thing, among others, but I only have time for one. What does that involve? It means we need to be a people of hospitality. That when people walk through these doors, when people encounter one of us, from Celebration Church, we are helping to make people feel accepted, comfortable, and loved where they are, where, wherever they may be, but realizing that Jesus can make the difference in their life. We need to be those people of grace and truth, just as Jesus was. So the question I want to ask you today and I'll bet this is one that maybe many of us have never even thought about. And the question is this, who might the Lord want to use you to reach out and touch for Him in 2024? You know, we can all sit pretty comfortable right here. We're in church, we're in town and country, it's great. We're around Christians. But you know, we've got a lot of people who still live in this community who do not know Jesus yet. And they are watching. Oh, they are watching our lives. Are we making Jesus attractive to them by the way we speak with them, by the way we behave, and by the way we treat them? That's just the beginning. But oh, we need to think, how might God want to use me to reach some of these people that God has placed in my life in 2024? But would you pray with me, and then we'll be dismissed, all right? Lord, we thank you today that you are in the business of seeking lost people. Lord, use us like the Savior to love and engage and reach out to people 
who you have placed right around us in our lives, who may have yet to place their faith in you. But Lord, you're wanting to love and reach them just as much as you reached us. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of what you're doing in our world today. Amen.